Well, Nancy, thanks. I, I'll, I'll tee it up first, but thank you for this opportunity. So happy to be a part of the front and center conversation. And you have such a star studded cast of folks that join this call. Any of these folks, Julia, could have this conversation in addition to the two of us. But, but Nancy, thank you. And I know our fearless leader, PJ, is on the call. So, PJ, thank you for your awesome leadership. And when you we're, talk, we're going to talk about cultural institutions, and the Center Club is no doubt at the top of that list. And I'm a proud member of the board, along with Julia, and we uh, we just uh, want to continue to to talk about the greatness of of the of the Center Club and how it plays in this cultural experience. But um, Julia, your educational background makes me feel like a slacker, so thank you for that. Um, and but I can I can. No, I just didn't want. I just I had fear of going out into the real world, like failure to launch. <laughs> Yeah, right. But I can just say as, as sort of starting this conversation, uh, you all know my background, but I'm coming up on four years in Baltimore and I'm as excited today of marketing and selling this city as I was day one coming to Baltimore. And um, I, I still believe this is one of the most special communities in the country. And so I'm, I'm really grateful and honored to, to be heading up um, the travel and tourism efforts here in Baltimore. I look at myself as a destination marketeer, and I've been doing this for about 28 years now, and um, I'm still learning every day. And obviously where we're sitting today, going through this pandemic, um, none of us would have envisioned this just 60 days ago. So um, we, we have to really, I think, use our energy, our talent, our, our brains, and really work together to get us out of this one. But um, you all should know, and I've met with a number of you all on this call, but I think at the right time, the brand message that we at Visit Baltimore have been working on the past uh, year, I think really is gonna be something that can help us to really elevate the messaging of the, the arts and cultural space at the right time. Uh, we put it on pause, obviously, because nobody's traveling at this point, but we are ready to uh, launch it at the right time. And we've been doing some additional work with our five surrounding counties. And we're gonna have a civic pride campaign because we do feel it's extremely important that the Baltimore city message needs to be embraced by our five surrounding county friends. So that's gonna be a part of this storytelling, Julia, once we're ready to, to roll it out. But I wanted to really share with you that brand element, that rebrand campaign is, uh, teed up and ready to go, but we, we want to do it at the, at the right time. So I'm happy to be on this call and, and sharing the platform with Julia and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Well, Al, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. And I'm just going to echo everything that Al said about the Center Club and PJ and all the other board members who are on this call. And really every single one of you who is on this call um, is part of the cultural community and um, I'm just delighted. So I really hope that we get some time to chat amongst, you know, with, with each other at the end or even during the call, um, because I can learn from all of you. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what the Walters um, is, other than one of the top 25 museums in this country and also, you know, a nationally and internationally renowned uh, museum because of its incredible collection. One of the stars of which you see behind me. Um, uh, as my virtual background, the ideal city from the late 15th century. And what, you know, in 1934, uh, what was a private collection that had been intermittently open to the public here in Baltimore that had been created by a father and son was opened and, and given to the mayor and city council of Baltimore for the benefit of the public. It was two bit physical buildings in Mount Vernon, 23,000 objects, and a quarter of the fortune of the um, Walters family that were given to the mayor and city council of Baltimore in order to create, to be part of the creation and the future of a, one of the greatest cities in America. And that was the vision of our founder and his father. And one of the truly incredible things about the Walters is that it was always envisioned to be an institution that was for the public, 
There were no clauses um, or anything that had to do with race or class or women or men. Um, I will say that our founders were not necessarily on the more liberal side, but you know they had he, Henry Walters, the son, had the vision to think about his. Um, gift to the city as one that would ensure the, the the that Baltimore be a city for all for everyone and actually an inclusive city. Um, so in 1934 we opened as a public museum and we've just celebrated our 85th anniversary. But in 2014 we went completely free. We had gone free general admission in 2006, and in 2014 and going sort of completely free, no longer charging um, for exhibitions, we also decided that we needed to be focused not on the kind of international and national tourism market, which has always been part of our, um, part of our, you know, annual operating um, goal to be, to be of service to the national and international audiences. And, and what we thought about was exactly what Al is talking about we need to be of service to Baltimore City and Baltimore, the Baltimore region and the state of Maryland first, because if we can't serve the communities that surround us most closely, we will not be of necessity. So I have a friend who works in Chicago at a museum and we have um, shamelessly stolen her uh, tagline, which is of world renown, but of local necessity. And I think that that is what is incredible about what we can offer at the Walters. And what I will say is that that is what every single cultural institution and both individually and collectively we can do and are doing for this great city, th these great counties and regions and this state. And so having lived in California, Connecticut, and now Maryland, and then you know a variety of different places in between, what I can say is that Baltimore is extraordinary. It is unique. There is no city of this size in this country that has three world-class arts museums, a huge um, ecosystem of visual arts galleries and artists, and also the performing arts and other cultural institutions, the BSO, all the museums and um, performing arts organizations that are on this call represent what really is the thing that separates out Baltimore from other cities. Not only are we Eds and Meds, but we are culture. And so our responsibility is to stop telling the story that The Wire was, you know, a disaster, but say, yeah, The Wire is the thing. It is one of the greatest cultural manifestations of art in the 20th century and we can own that because it was made here right <laughs> so we need to turn the narrative around and that is why al is so important in this in this um moment for us because he understands that it's about it's not about the reality it's actually about the narrative and so al that that's well, where i think you're, you're right on the money here and i i think one of the things that I wanted to share with the folks on, on this call is that when I came to town almost four years ago, Visit Baltimore was really looked at as being more of a inner harbor centric organization, that our focus was to help the convention center with conventions, help our hotels that are primarily in the central business district be successful along with the restaurants. And we've made a concerted effort over the past three and a half years to make sure that our message is all of Baltimore City, not just the Central Business District, and that um, it was important for us to make sure in our messaging um, and what we do, that we partner with arts and cultural organizations all over Baltimore City, um, because this, this is a true economic engine, if you will, for the community. And, um, we should be celebrating all the goodness and all the great gifts of these institutions around Baltimore. And that's a part of our storytelling. And as we uh, went through this rebranding and we did some surveys, the one thing that bubbled up to the tops, and not surprisingly, but it just reconfirmed our mission, what bubbled up was arts and culture is Baltimore. And that was the number one thing that stood up and a number of you all on this call were a part of that exercise. And, you know, I 
you won't see it today, but when we roll out this new brand message, you're going to really see arts and culture throughout the theme of it. Because quite frankly, uh, arts and culture in Baltimore, that's our DNA. That's really who we are as a city. Um, we should be doing our part to celebrate that. And uh, as I, I say to people all the time, I think we, uh, we sort of play uh, above our weight when it comes to arts and culture throughout this country. And both Julie, you, myself, we li we've lived in a number of other destinations, but the arts and cultural message is one of the strengths, two strengths of, of Baltimore. And we want to be celebrating that storyline more and more as we move forward. And because I, I believe that's one of the reasons people move here. That's the reason why people stay. That's why the students in our academic institutions fall in love with this community and don't leave once they graduate. So I believe Visit Baltimore, we should be doing our part to partner with our arts and cultural institutions and help leverage your story and tell it broader and better than we've ever told it before. So I think we're, we're at a point with this story that we can go places that we really haven't gone before and celebrate the Walters and the, BS, the BSO and uh, uh, the Lewis and all the great institutions that are here in the city. Right, then Anita is on this call and she's the director of the BNO, uh, of the, um, oh, I just had it, but it's the, the amazing Museum of Industry. And, you know, so many things start here and the way that you keep that legacy alive is through the work that museums do. So um, arts and culture isn't just, you know, the painting from 15, 15, circa 1500 that was done in Italy. It's a, such a broader um, array, a, array of talents and individuals. And, you know, Cindy, um, Cindy Wolf was just named yet again as a finalist for the James Beard um, Award and, you know, culinary the culinary arts are now one of baltimore's greatest um assets so if you put together fine art performing art culinary art you you really do see a different picture of baltimore and why we should be shouting out that again a city of our size we punch way above our weight in that um and so i i think it's really great and in a moment right now things like um you know the moment of covid or i can say in the days after the uprisings um in 2015 after the death of freddie gray you know it was the cultural institutions it was the libraries it was those places where we come together to think about our humanity that provided moments of solace and ways for us to come together and discuss really challenging topics um, and and to to think about them together in ways that were productive and not divisive and so as we think about what we are doing right now at the museum when the museum stores are closed we're providing um, enormous services to the baltimore city schools the baltimore county schools the schools from the regions around who have no um access to their arts education or any of that because that's in the classroom so we've transformed our pedagogic resources and are are giving those out for free um, as we always are um, to the city schools and we've become really a, an anchor for them in these times as well in terms of pedagogy so you know instead of thinking about the arts as a luxury human human society depends on the arts every society in every part of the world across time has made music has made paintings has written in literature whatever form of storytelling in whatever form it occurs those are things that we do as humans and the places where we preserve that humanity are our arts and culture the cultural communities so they're more than more than ever we need them right now nancy do you want to move to the next slide please Al, do you have anything to say after my little soapbox there? No, I mean, again, I, I think you're right on the money. And this is a good segue here for, you know, I mentioned a little bit about the economic uh, development angle. But um, I look at uh, the great work that all the folks on this phone, Anita and, you know, Jonathan, Donna's on the phone, a lot of great workers and Jeannie, everybody's doing great work. I, I really believe that uh, pre-COVID in my space, 
Um, you know, we were talking a lot about, you know, hotels and restaurants and um, what we do for the convention center. But I believe the, the communities that are really going to be those successful post-COVID are the ones that are really going to embrace these great natural resources in your, in your communities, and that's arts and culture. And uh, it's a, I believe, it's a real quality of life. It's, and I mentioned that's why people live here and stay here. We have a great creative class here in, in Baltimore. And, and we're going to have to all come together in this messaging um, now, and we could, we could use and, and, and leverage each other and come together with this huge economic development story that we're talking about, and it's in the, the arts and cultural space. And I believe that, you know, surrounding us with the DC, south of us, Philly North, Boston and New York, we have a great, great story that we can celebrate here and begin to, post COVID, people are not gonna wanna get on a, a plane in the next six months, 12 months. And they're gonna be more comfortable jumping in a car, uh, driving to a city like Baltimore. And I think we can use that as an opportunity to really celebrate and drive people to these great institutions and, and great gyms that we have here in Baltimore City. I mean, this notion of um, tourism only having to do with a plane is ridiculous or, or even a train. And um, the idea that you can be a tourist if you live where I do, which is just at the edge of Baltimore County and Baltimore City and on Charles Street up, up north, um, you know, it's, I'm a tourist when I go downtown or when I go down to see Anita or if I go to the Lyric, I'm still a tourist, right? I am taking part in the culture economy but it's it, it is it is a destination for me so flipping the idea that destination what did you say a destination marketeer only works on the outside of the state is ridiculous it's really the in-state people who need to have need to have take ownership of those amazing resources that they help support because if you only depend on the people from the outside you are so vulnerable economically Julie, and, i agree i mean i you know our number one customer are our residents right yeah. that those are our number one folks and i believe if you know, we we used to talk in our industry a lot about uh, travel like a local and i believe we need to get back to that we need to be able to share with our great residents in the city, the residents in our surrounding counties, all of these great institutions that are here. And you don't need to go, obviously nobody's going international right now, not unless you're, you're crazy. Um, and you, you may not want to take the long haul travel to California or somewhere else. So we have a huge opportunity right now to really celebrate all this goodness that we've been able to build over a number of years here. Um, a lot of what we have is undiscovered and we can mm. help really celebrate this and, and get that 200 mile and out family to come see us and fall into love with a community that they may have heard about. They may have gotten mixed signals on and really see a community that's doing some great work in the arts and cultural community. And, and there's no question that this, you know, I tell folks in this industry and arts and culture are part of what we do in tourism. We are the third largest industry in this city. And we employ 85,000 people within the MSA. And unfortunately wow. right now, and, it, and it's sad, that majority of those 85,000 people are out of work right now. Mm -hmm. and, um, so we, we have a huge opportunity to, to figure out at the right time when the governor and other health and science officials let us know it's the right time to reopen. We have to figure out how do we reinvigorate this economy, um, get it going again, and I really believe that we have a huge opportunity to, to really set Baltimore ahead of some other destinations that may not come back as fast as us because, um, because of density, they, it's gonna be slower for them to reopen. And I think we have an opportunity to, to do it in a right way. And you know, maybe what COVID has done for us as a community is to get out, get out of our silo messages that we've been doing a lot so independently. And with COVID, it's forcing us to collaborate and we're doing a lot of these zoom calls and we're talking to each other more and we're collaborating i believe that's going to be one of the positive takeaways from COVID, that it, especially baltimore because we're a very silo community it's yeah. forcing us to talk to each other and be more closer collaborate figure it out come up with some strategic 
initiatives that are cross sectional, not just in one space, but do something that impacts all of us. Absolutely. And this whole notion of, um, you know, the, the, the density of opportunity and actually the low cost of cultural tourism or even just tourism in this city. You know, you think about um, everyone says, oh, well, you know, all the museums in Washington are free. Well, you know what? Most of the museums in, in Baltimore are partially or fully free. <laughs> so, you know, it, it isn't much more, um, much more expensive. And then you can also go to, you know, you can go to the Museum of Industry in the morning, you can go have lunch somewhere, you can come to us in the afternoon, you can go to the Lyric in the evening, you can then go to the BSO for a Sunday matinee or, you know, reverse that all around and then go to the BMA. Um, you can have on a Friday and a Saturday for much less money than going to New York where, okay, MoMA charges $25 for you to walk in the door. Right. You can go to the BMA for free and you see, in my opinion, just as great art as at MoMA. And it's not as exhausting because you don't feel like you have to go through the whole thing. Um, so so the, the, the manageable size of Baltimore is also one of its greatest strengths. And if we can only solve the parking problem, um, we will be golden. <laughs> I'll let but you maybe, on that one, Julia. Yeah. 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 And I think I think you I think you're absolutely right. And um, you know, with our new rebrand that we're going to roll out, as I mentioned, arts and cultures at the top, we really believe that there's no doubt we have to get our local residents excited about our community and our five surrounding counties. It's incumbent on them to help us rebuild this great city of Baltimore. So we want to make sure that uh, when we roll this messaging out arts and culture is front and center to it. And we celebrate all of the venues that you all work on that's on this call and people can see it. And not only in our messaging here in, in, in the city, but we also want to identify some of these uh, influencers here in the arts and cultural space and use their face and voices out of market as well so they can bring people in in that 100, 200 miles away and they can really come see us. And I think we need to be a little bit more um, authentic and appealing in our message and use Baltimore faces, Baltimore yeah. voices to really celebrate all the, the goodness that our venues have to offer. It really is a, um, a challenge because um, having lived in San Diego, it's a little bit the same way where the, the San Diegans, and I said this when I first moved here, San Diego is magical. I grew outside, grew up outside Los Angeles. And, you know, going to San Diego was a little bit like going to the ranch town. It really wasn't that exciting. It was, the, you know, kind of hillbilly. And, um, but what that was, was San Diegans' ability to hide the magic, right? They didn't want lots of people coming in from elsewhere because they believed that their town was better without all those other people who didn't care about it. Right? So, you know, we almost intentionally hide our light under the bushel because we like small tomorrow. We like having, you know, this not having, not being the hustle and bustle. It's part of our DNA. It's the whole notion of, you know, the best thing about Baltimore are the neighborhoods. So this, this notion of the small um, collective, some of its parts, but really it's just the parts that make up the whole, as opposed to thinking of the whole as something really fabulous, that ends up coming around in a moment like this to hurt us because we don't know how to collaborate very well. Um, we're very good at, you know, individually talking about our, our own institutions, um, and our own neighborhoods. So, you know, the Walters is identified with Mount Vernon, which means that when you're advertising the Inner Harbor, we're just five blocks north, but, you know, we're not the Inner Harbor. So I've been here for seven years. And the other day, maybe last week, was the first time that I was on a call with all of the directors, the CEOs of all of the attractions in Baltimore. Seven years. I mean, that is indicative of why we can't tell one positive story um, and why our stories are told 
by other people for us. Um, so, so I think yeah. that may be a good segue there. I think the next section is really talking a little bit about where we are today with, with COVID, if I'm, if I'm yeah. If, let's see, what's the next slide, Nancy? It's a surprise. Tourism after COVID. Excellent. So let me let me just throw out a little data data points for all of us to think about because COVID has changed the game for everybody. So um, this is information coming from Oxford Economics. We use them a lot to get uh, da uh, data points for, for Visit Baltimore. But um, spending, travel spending in the month of April was down 86%. Oh. This, is, this is a national number. May, they're projecting about 75%. June, revenue down about 60%, and it gets to 35%, which is not a good number, but 35% in December. So nationally, nobody's moving right now. And then when you look at the state, and this number comes from US travel, there, when you look at May over May, last May to this May, spending is down 88% in, in travel in the state of Maryland. And now let's come locally. Majority of our hotels are closed, and the ones that are open, occupancy is in the low teens, 12, 13%. Most of them are at single digit occupancy. Wow. And the hotel industry has lost about $35 million in revenue here in Baltimore. And you know, our rest, you know, the story about the restaurant tours, and unfortunately, Alexander Brown and well, City Cafe, right? I mean, 25 right. years. Staple just, in Raleigh Seafood um, over in Fed Hill is closed up for good. And it's probably going to, we're going to hear more um, sobering stories like that moving forward. So with COVID, we're going to have to play totally different if we want to be successful as a destination and as an industry moving forward. And the collaboration is going to be vitally important moving forward. This industry in Baltimore, when you talk about travel and hospitality, is essentially closed. Mm -hmm. and so lost revenue, people out of work, and I'll go back to this 85,000 employed number again, because this, yeah. is, this is important. Out of that 85,000, about 60 plus thousand live in Baltimore City. And demographically, the majority are low skilled, low educated. Great workers, but that's who, who they are. So where does this huge community go if we don't find a way of reopening this community at the right time? We have to figure it out to reinvest in it. Uh, we submitted a plan to Mayor Young and his team a couple of weeks ago with some thoughts we have on paper that has a, a arts and cultural focus to it. Um, but I think once we hear from the governor, when's the right, because this is the, this is the really happy dance here. When's the right time? We can't get out in front of science and health. We have to do it the right way. But once we decide we're going to reopen, there's no question in my mind, we have to figure out how we put these folks back to work. Absolutely. What's our messaging going to be to really uh, get this tourism industry back going? I, I think we have an opportunity to do it the right way, but we're, we can't do it pre-COVID. That, that game's over. We have to now begin to look at strategically what's going to be the new way that we rebuild this tourism economy. And um, I think we're going to have to do it talking to each other, partnering together. Locals, the, the local market is king initially. The meetings and convention industry is going to take that 12 to 18 months to come back. Because until there's a vaccine, folks are going to be hesitant to get on a plane to fly. Well, we were talking, um, I've been talking to Dr. Wen, one of Baltimore's greats, and she we spoke to our board and she said, you know, it's actually not about the vaccine. It's about the vaccinations. And if you think about all of, you know, many of you on the call are my age and just trying to get that shingles shot. I mean, it's taken me three years and I still haven't gotten it, right? There's a, there is a shot for it, but it's impossible to get. So there's the, the layer of, we don't even have a vaccine. And then 
the, the accessibility of that vaccine is going to be another thing. So you're absolutely right. And, you know, it's incumbent on us um, not to squander this crisis because we, um, you know, so the Baltimore, the, the Walters Museum and the Baltimore Museum of Art, I, I know a little bit about their staff, so I, don't, I can't, can't speak to some of the great institutions that are on this call. So please feel free to join in. But for instance, at the Walters Museum, we employ 150 people and 60, actually 73% of our employees are Baltimore City residents. 99% of our employees. So we have one employee who lives outside Maryland. And then 80, I think it's 89% are Baltimore City and Baltimore County residents. So we are an incredibly important major employer in Mount Vernon for the city with our employment taxes. So we're free. So we're not dependent on earned in income. Um, but we do um, have to pay these employees. And then we end up recycling the money back into these these environments, right? So one of the things that we decided when we closed on March 13th was that it was our responsibility as a civic institution and, you know, the mayor and the city council of Baltimore still own a large part of our collection, three of our five buildings. Um, and it was our responsibility to keep our employees employed because that is part of the problem, right? If we put, you know, do furloughs or layoffs, um, we're just contributing to the problem rather than really thinking about how, what, what kind of hard choices can we make to keep our, our employees employed because it is, we are an, a major employer in the part of our, in the part of the city that we are in. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we're all, we all need to think a little bit differently about this. And when people say, oh, the arts and culture, that's just luxury. We have got to change the narrative. And I know that Jeannie and Donna both have at their fingertips the actual amounts of money that the arts and culture industry drive in the state of Maryland. It is not insignificant. Um, so I don't know if, if at the end of the call they can, they can let us know what that is. I don't have that in my head. That's my COVID brain. So hey, you're well, absolutely right. Let me share this with the group too, the, to give some serious consideration to um, when we talk about um, our industry on the other side of COVID. And this is, this is coming from data that we're seeing around the country. Uh, the number one question that the consumer has is, if I come visit your city, if I come to Baltimore, if I go to the Walters Museum, if I go to the Museum of Industry, if I go to the Lyr Lyric, when I leave and go home, will my family and friends be safe? Will I be safe? Um, and, and to that end, to me, post-COVID, that's the number one question that we have to address and answer because we have to give people some comfort. And so a number of our hoteliers are going through some protocols and setting up best practices. Some of our restaurants are looking at that. Um, Visit Baltimore, we've done some due diligence on this one because, again, we think that's going to be the number one place that we need to play. So there's an international organization called the International Sanitary and Supply Association out of Chicago, and they've come up with an accreditation program that cities and venues and hoteliers and restaurateurs can go through to give their employees, when folks come back to work, give them some comfort that you've gone through a sanitation, hygiene, cleanliness type of steps. Um, and it also is good for visitors who come to our places of attractions like a, the, the Walters Mu Museum or, or come to a hotel, that they can see a good seal of approval that we've gone through a process. Yeah. And so we've had a conversation with uh, several businesses here in Baltimore. We did a call yesterday. We're going to do another call on tomorrow. We've talked to the mayor and team about this concept. We've talked to Dr. De DeRaza a health commissioner about it. Um, this is something that I would love to hear from you all because I believe it's something that could help all of us. A third party can partner with us and bring us some best practices, if you will. And we go through an accreditation and everybody can see that Baltimore gets it. If I come there, you've gone through a process. It's, no, it's not 100%, but you've given me 
uh, some assurances that I'm going to be okay if I come visit. So that's, a, that's something that we want to sort of bring to the community. And we love that. And I know that um, I've talked to a number of cultural leaders and I think it's just a great idea. We, um, we also, you know, this is another area where maybe our size plays in our favor because, you know, we're not talking about 2 million visitors in six months, right? I mean, we're talking about 170,000 people who come to the Walters a year. So the experience that we can provide post COVID will be different, but the density of the people who visit our institutions on a regular basis is not such that we have to complete, it will, it will feel foreign. I think it's very different though for our performing arts institutions. And so we owe it to them to partner with them to figure out what ways that their performers can actually interact with in spaces where the visitors can be far apart, you know, so. But I do think this is an area where the density factor is in our favor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so we, we should be thinking about that. The other thing that we all are doing just incredibly well right now, and I hope it helps you leverage the, the next stage, Al, is that all of us have turned our um, focus on how we can maintain connections with our, with our constituents or our consumers or our guests, um, largely through digital programming. But what we're doing isn't, we're not replacing the on-site experience. What we are doing is we're creating um, more touch. I, I like to feel we're sort of wetting people's appetite um, for coming back in whatever way we want them to come back. And we are providing them with resources that will actually be amplifying after we go back to being having our doors open. So mm -hmm. instead of just kind of sitting there with your doors closed and then creating something that's different from what we're gonna have in place afterwards, we're, we're thinking in an additive way. So we're using this moment to amplify, as I said earlier, um, the offerings that Baltimore can have. And actually we're, we're also providing a service that allows us to serve more statewide folks creating a sense of ownership that will then, even if you think more regionally, sort of Delmarva and the extended region, that once travel happens on, a, on that tighter, but still more attenuated in the city and the counties, um, creating opportunities for people to connect with us in ways now that will drive them to us in the future. And I know that every leader on this call is doing this and thinking about it. So um, we're really yeah. grateful to you, Al, to help us bring it all together. At, well, at, Again, I, I believe, you know, think about it, Baltimore City for far too long, people think of us from a public safety perspective. And, and obviously we have more work to do there. Absolutely. But I believe if we, if we can come together on this public health accreditation um, initiative, I think we can begin to perhaps change the conversation in a way we haven't done before because Baltimore as far as health, we're the, mech, we're the healthcare mecca in this country. Johns Hopkins, every day you, you look at TV during this time period, there's somebody from Hopkins being interviewed, right? And, or in University of Maryland Medical. And so if we could come together and create this really awesome accreditation um, initiative and get Johns Hopkins to partner with us, yeah. get the University of Maryland to partner with us, now all of a sudden as a destination, we're saying we are the public health place to come see us. If you right. come here and visit, stay at a hotel, go visit a museum, you're going to feel comfortable. And the city of Dallas is the only city thus far that has partnered on this initiative. There are a number of other cities that's looking at this one. Um, a number of convention centers from around the country have, have joined in. The Hyatt Hotel uh, Corporation has joined on board. But I think... Um, in a very strange way with COVID, it's, it's put attention on healthcare. And again, that's, that's, that's important for Baltimore. And if we do this right, we could really use that leverage, use that story to really re-engage a, a story on arts and culture as well. So I hope uh, you all can see some value in that. I love that point. And you know, just to make the connection, ever more we're understanding that health and wellness has to do with 
um, the mindset that you have and museums and performing arts organizations and cultural, cultural, um, the cultural economy create um, really a culture of wellness. In fact, we always joke at the Walters, the New York Times put out an article about three months ago that said that visiting a museum has now been shown through health studies to prolong your life. And so we like to call ourselves, you know, the art spa. <laughs> and actually a visit to the Walters is a healthy opportunity for you, <laughs> healthy activity. Um, so I think that this, this really allows us, if we think holistically and stop separating eds and meds from the culture, cultural assets that are here in Baltimore and make the connections that are inherent and that live within those sectors, um, that we have this opportunity to change our narrative. And if you look, you worked in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh is the shining example of 20 years ago, the no, foundations to... and the cultural leaders and the industry leaders. They were not the Fortune 500 companies. Right. You know, we can lament the loss of the Fortune 500 companies. That's the past. Let's look at the future. So 10, 20 years ago, foundations, culture, and um, you know the major the major industries or the the you know T row prices of the of Pittsburgh got together and said, all right, what story do we want to tell about ourselves? And let's look at the fact that Pittsburgh is now a destination for a whole lot of people. It's a place where people go. We're not talking about the crime and the grit and the horror of you know Pittsburgh slash flash dance, right? Um, we're we're talking about Pittsburgh as a location we all want to move our families to. So if we can think about how also we position um, the cultural industry as one of the larger um, suppliers of education in this city, we all work with the schools and we all have deep relationships with the communities that we serve in terms of arts education, but also you know, math and literature. We teach all of that now through the visual arts because that's something that we know works and you know we live in the most visually acute society since the middle ages we are fewer people who know how to read than people who understand a picture and they don't know that they understand a picture but they do because they watch tv they you know it's a hugely visual society so we need to also start talking about ourselves as part of the educational system and that will also help change the idea that, you know, Baltimore is a place where you can't send your kids to school. And so we have a lot of opportunity to help lift, you know, all the boats need to rise together. But I wonder if you want to talk about Pittsburgh, because you were there then, weren't you? Or you were a, a young buck. <laughs> started to come back for sure. And they, they, the business community partner to, to rebuild and get away from you know, the old steel mills were gone and what are we gonna do now? And so now they have a bunch of startups, they're doing a good job. But I, I would say again, I think Baltimore from an asset uh, perspective, Pittsburgh, they're in a different league. I mean, we're, we're five-star league, they're three or four-star league. Absolutely, like, and they're the destination city. <laughs> so I, I, I think, I, I think this is a, an opportunity for us. And um, again, you know, COVID, uh, I mean, who would have guessed this one? And we've never lived through this. And we're going to have to play in a totally different way if we want to survive. And um, I'm hopeful, I'm very optimistic that um, if through the arts and cultural space, we have such great stories to tell, there's no reason in my mind cities like where a lot of folks move to, the Nashvilles of the world, the Austins, the Savannahs, the Charlestons, all those are, you know, special communities. I've visited all, they're great. But again, we have, when you put it all together, we have much more to offer. And I think we, it's a part of our storytelling that now we wanna make this arts and cultural story front and center. And mm -hmm. um, I think we have a huge opportunity to, to now to tell it, it's gonna help us to rebuild a very important industry here in, in Baltimore City. And we can become leaders in this one. And uh, I believe if we do it right and we all come together and you know leave our egos at the door, I, I believe we can do it very uh, 
very well. And uh, the, the communities who really do that on the other side of COVID are the ones that are going to be successful. And there are going to be other communities. It's going to take them 5, 10, 15 years to, to recover. Because this is like anything else we've ever seen in our lifetime. And uh, we're going to have to play very smartly and very strategically. And uh, I think we can do it. Um, and just to, I was on a call with the director of the, um, the CEO of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker. And he was talking about the fact that the future lies in those institutions that, and, and cities and, and people who do their business in this moment with an eye to service and with an eye to community. And, you know, Baltimore does those two things really, really well. So that's just yet another asset that we have that if we put it together and if we, instead of competing or saying, well, you know, we're one museum and, you know, the BMA and the Walters are in a big fight. Well, you know what, we're not in a big fight. We are, we are, all part of the same community and we only hurt each other when we when we think that way so i love what you're saying about just coming together and talking about how we how we lift the community up and how we are part of you know baltimore has this opportunity also to provide the example for being a community that that prides itself on healing and um you know we have this opportunity now to do that both from the disease perspective and from the societal perspective. And the way to do that is by coming together through the arts. Now that sounds really mushy and, you know, groovy, no, I, but, I, but it is about how we talk about ourselves and how we believe in ourselves. So I think, I, agree. And I think, I think Julia, um, this is my perspective. I'm could, I'm, I'm sure I could be wrong, but I think society, I think human, nature they're looking for great leadership right now and um we as an industry and as a community and i'm talking arts and culture and hospitality all together everything we we, we could come together and really give people tremendous hope and show them that this is what real leadership looks like and come up with a a plan of action that people want to join and and people need to, they want hope again. They want to feel good about their community. They're looking for folks who can really lead and tell a good story, be honest with them and truthful. And that's the art space. We, we can let people be creative and be their best selves and, and do things differently. There's no straight line to success. And I believe if, if we all look at this and, and, and put our, our minds together, that we could be the real stimulus that this community needs. And uh, I, I think that we have a huge opportunity to do it. And I think people are looking for who's willing to step out there and lead. And I believe our industry could, could do that. And you said something in the, our earlier conversations, you know, this is, these are industries that are really on the brink. And when you think about, and I see Donna and Jeannie have, have added, um, so the economic income in Maryland, the arts generate $28 million in household income. And then they provide 600 and over $600 million in economic impact. So if we think they're a luxury, that's a, it's a luxury that drives, drives money through the economy. So we need to, um, we need to make sure that we don't go the other way because we are on that brink. So I'd love, I, I don't know, Al, do you have anything, do you want to open it up and hear from some of the august? Yeah, I'd love to, yeah, love to open it up if anyone has any questions for us, for sure. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Linda Hutchison, if, if I can ask a question. Um, I had attended a thing a while ago about cultural renovation in DC and they focus specifically on renovating Chinatown so it could bring back the tourists that it used to um, when maybe people were first generation or something like that. Um, so when we're talking not so much institutions but we're talking about culture and the tourism draw, is there any 
partnering with some of the communities such as Little Italy or China, you know, I mean, uh, Greek Town or things like that, are those brought into the conversation? Absolutely, they should be. And we talk a lot about that at the Walters. You know, I have this, um, this image behind me that um, is one of the great prides of, um, it is, is a flashpoint of pride for um, Italians all over the world. It's one of three paintings. And so think about even just Little Italy, you know, the, there is a, um, a sort of focus around Italian heritage and culture. Um, we also have uh, an incredible Asian collection, pan-Asian collection. So we work with communities that are from all over Asia in the city and bring them to the museum and talk about their culture. Or um, we have a collection of um, works from uh, Central and South America, uh, primarily sort of pre-discovery, discover, you know, pre what we used to call pre-Columbian. And I'm... Um, and what we are finding is that a lot of the children of um, recent immigrants to this country love to come and see the map and see the work of their culture here in this country so that they can connect back and forth. And, you know, instead of parsing out everything culture by culture, what is amazing is when you come to a place like the Walters, you can actually learn about a culture that is completely foreign to you. So it is the opportunity for us to build bridges across those communities that live here in Baltimore. And again, have those kind of conversations that allow us to talk about, well, what is the divide? You know, why is coronavirus providing us an anti-immigrant moment for conversation? Let's talk about that here. And let's think about, you know, the fact that China is really one of the oldest still extant and going cultures in the world. It's just we don't learn that in America. So to your point also about innovation in the, in the stream and the entrepreneurship, um, we have not been very good in Baltimore and the region in connecting in a meaningful way the startup industry and the innovation industry and the arts community whether that be the individual artists or the institutions, the museum institutions. And I think Anita with the Museum of Industry, it's a much more um, sort of, uh, e it's an easier jump to make, but it is a huge lacuna. And it's a huge problem that we have not connected those two communities because that is an area where we actually could leverage the individual assets to create something really extraordinary that, you know, is not happening in Silicon Valley. I mean, the great um, conundrum is that really the artistic culture in Sa the San Francisco area and the Bay Area is one of the most retarded terror cultures. And the, the innovation industry is theoretically not interested in the arts. Well, your phone doesn't, this, this thing doesn't exist without design. This is one of the most designed, you don't have this because it works well. You have it because you like the way it looks and it's easy. I mean, yes, you have it because it works well, but there are more pictures on this thing than there are words. And so we have this opportunity in Baltimore to, to leverage those two together. It's just, we have to start talking to each other and actually creating meaningful dialogue. <laughs> if I could just add a little bit to this conversation and um, talking about design, I encourage you to go look at abstract on Netflix if you haven't seen that show yet. It's really cool talking about designers. But I, I totally agree. I think we could do a much better job with our uh, makers, our innovators. So one of the concepts, and we've, we've shared, it, shared this with the mayor's team, and we haven't talked to a lot of people about it. It's in our tourism recovery plan if it can get funded. But we think there's a huge opportunity post COVID to create an experience in the Inner Harbor. So if you recall last summer, m and Bank took the container and they would invite some of the pop-ups to set up shop right there on Pratt. So the company who, who uh, put that concept on, we've had some conversations with them. Um, Downtown Partnership's been at the table, Waterfront Partnership with Lori and her team. And Donna, we wanna bring you in this conversation, but there's an opportunity, this group would love to create some containers down at the Inner Harbor. Because right now the Inner Harbor, is we don't know where that's gonna go for years. But what if we come out and create an experience whereby we can create these pop-ups so our, our innovators, our makers can come down, set up shop, 
in these containers periodically. We wouldn't do it 24 seven, but we'll find a certain time of year where a big festival is in town, major convention, once we get all the social distancing stuff figured out. But we think this is an, op yeah, this is an opportunity to really get our residents excited, get the regional folks coming back to see us, have it very bright and colorful with these containers, have some music, some art, businesses who are in maybe Mount Vernon, Fed Hill, and they want to come downtown and have a space that's cool and hip and, and really high energy. We think there's an opportunity to create this experience. So we, um, it comes with a nice little price point, but we believe if we're really thinking about innovation, these makers that the question uh, alluded to, I think there's an opportunity there that we can really create an experience that we don't have today. Um, in that space. Um, I, I think Peter Zomi has a question. He's, he promises Al that it's not going to be too hard for us, but Peter, I want, I, I, you know, I'm ready. <laughs> hey, hey, good evening, everybody. PJ and the club, thanks for hosting this. It's terrific. And uh, Al and Julia are really am enjoying this conversation. So here is my question. Can you talk a little bit about the phases of recovery? And so here's how I'm thinking about it, and I'd appreciate your thoughts. One is we're all stuck at home now. Then, for, at least for the arts organizations, there's going to be a time when we can start to return to work with the staff and begin to have some kind of content. Maybe it's all going to be digital at first. So it's going to, that second phase is going to be we begin to return to work. And then finally, probably after there's a vaccine, there, we're going to be actually beginning to be you know, approaching normalcy again. And then a long time from now, the fourth phase will be when the pandemic is a memory. So four phases, we're stuck at home, then we're going to begin to return. We, we get the vaccine and then, you know, a long time from now, we, we, we will have all, I hope, be forgetting about this. So that is my question. Thank you very much. So um, I'll, I'll just say that last night my phone blew up and Connie McAllister saved me. I just I just done my you know exercise and I thought okay I'm finally finished with my Zoom for the day. This is crazy. And then like ten people said the governor he's just announced that art galleries can open. Are you are you going to open? <laughs> Kind of trying to figure out what he meant by art galleries and it was really clear that what he means are you know retail art galleries that are small shop like barber shops and um you know it's not we're not nordstrom selling inside it's nordstrom curbside pickup so um we are definitely not phase one um and peter you and i have talked about how um you know at best maybe maybe some of the larger organizations are at the end of phase two um, but you know, again, what kind of what kind of experience are you really going to have when you come into the museum and you have to stand? You can't read a label on the wall because it has to be six feet. You know, there's going to be a tiny little painting or whatever it is, and then a label that's this big because you have to be six feet away from it to read. Um, so if we're and I think most of us in this group are actually more likely phase three and possibly even what you're talking about is phase four, um, and I think that where we where our challenge is that people need us now more than ever um, and i know from my colleagues outside of baltimore how um you know museums like the the buffalo bill museum and cody um cody they they had people lined up like they were trader joe's the morning when they had when they opened because people wanted that that they wanted art and um, it's a great museum by the way um but so how do we how do we do that and i think you're right it's 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 later rather than sooner and so coming together and thinking about how we can each leverage each other's um digital assets and what we're doing for for our communities through online or um or not online but through assets that we distribute through meal sites um, for those folks who are not on one side of the digital divide um, but we really need to act as one community because it's going to be a while um, for us. And I don't know, what, what do you think, Al and, and Peter well, and I, I Jonathan? Think, I think your, that, that's your, your question is, is very appropriate and it's one that it's hard to answer, right? Because we, we don't know 
um, when we can truly say we're going to be reopened. And you're absolutely right. I mean, we've been on telework in my shop since March the 13th. And so when we get the go ahead from the governor and the mayor that we can come back to the office, that's going to be in phases as well. And we probably will go on a staggered type of work schedule. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to have some employees who don't feel comfortable coming back to the office. And so we're going to have to be very flexible and uh, continue to allow them to telework. So I think it's no doubt it's going to be a phased in process, both with our employees um, as well as for, you know, small, medium, large type of events. Um, but one of the things that I would love for us to think about at the right time, when we know we're open back up as a community, and I don't know if that's six months down the road, if it's 10 months, I, I, I would love to see us do a, a welcome back to Baltimore celebration whereby we can get the different venues that's on this phone involved and with music and art and, and really celebrating our residents. This is, you know, and I know Donna's done great work with, you know, all the great work she does with her festivals and, and this is really in her space, but I think Visit Baltimore would really want to partner with BOPA and, and other entities and what can we do to, at the right time um, to really get people feeling good again about we're on the so other side of this thing and, and get them to come to your venues and really enjoy and spend money, bring their families, have a good time. And I think that needs to be a part of our thought process too, as we look at this phasing in or reopening, we should be looking at this one time what, to, to celebrate whatever mm -hmm. that looks like and, and put another festival on, on Donna's plate. I'm, I'm sure she <laughs> Love that. Jonathan, what are your thoughts? So I think, first of all, thank you guys for putting this on. Thank you to the Center Club, Nancy and, and everyone. And thank you to Al and Julia for leading this. I, I think that it's, it mentions in our, in our case, since we don't have, we, we really are dependent on, on touring uh, performers coming through. The good news is that from a supply point of view, none of them are getting paid and there's tremendous demand on that end for comedians and for singers and for you know, people to, to come back out and to work because they, if they don't work, they don't get paid. Um, so we have that flexibility and we have the flexibility that whatever you know, different audiences are gonna be more comfortable coming back at different times. I think that'll be by age and by, um, mm -hmm. by their, you know, different, different things. I think you know, maybe people come out for comedians before they will come out for certain other things. I don't know, we're gonna see. But, and we'll work with, with people in the industry to figure out how that's gonna work. That's gonna be really important um, is understanding that what is the what is the seating capacity going to look like? What is um, how many people are we going to be able to use? I'm, I'm confident that when we reopen on day one, we're not going to have 2,500 seats filled. <laughs> uh, so what does that look like, and how do you do that? And working with artists, for how do you do that in a way that makes financial sense for the venue to open for the touring performers and for everyone? So it's really an industry wide thing. You know, it's the the promoters and the performers and the venues all working together to figure out what that new normal is gonna be so that everyone can, can reopen and, and make sense of it. And um, so I, I think that that's gonna be really important. And, the, and then the, the key is once that's all figured out is in that demand. Obviously people have lost jobs, they're gonna be, I think that the, the more, the, the bigger names and the more successful and prominent people will come back first because they'll have an easier time. Some might choose to go to a smaller venue rather than a large venue because it's less risk when they when they reopen, um, but we will we will see how that works out. But we're currently working on figuring out what is the you know the fiscal structure, and then obviously the environment. What Al talked about about being making sure that we are a venue that people feel comfortable coming back to is going to be very important. What does everything look like from what do bathrooms look like? Right. And, you know, are, are, is there no longer such a thing as intermission? Right. Well, on our architecture, right? All of us, I mean, I'm thinking of you and Peter in particular, we all have these old buildings that were built in the notion of how many people can you shove in one space? Um, or, you know, they, they don't have really good plumbing in my instance. Um, and, you know, only two of our 18, we have 18 bathrooms. <laughs> so think of the cleaning there. But it's expensive to change your architecture. But the experience that we want our audiences to have 
require that we think differently about the architecture that we have. So yeah. that's another upfront expense. So yeah. I think it's, yeah. Hey, Julia, this, this may not play as well in the museum space, or maybe it can. I think in the, in the performing arts and definitely BSO, I think one of the other things we may want to consider is how can we be, be more creative and use some of our outdoor space that's adjacent to our venues, working with the city, getting them to close streets off and do, and, the, and, and this is seasonal for us, right? We could probably only do it summer through fall and can't do it in the winter. Um, but I think we need to look at how do we utilize more of our outdoor space that's adjacent to our venue and do outdoor type concerts, outdoor type of entertainment. And I think in the short term, that's something we need to look at and, and partner with our city agencies to help us to create that experience that may not be inside the building, maybe inside the building is for the restroom, but everything else um, is outdoors in the short term. <laughs> So you mentioned outdoors, and so I turned on my video and my sound. Hi, everybody. Hi, and <laughs> Thank you for this fantastic discussion. I have a confession, which is I thought, oh, God, another Zoom meeting, the end of the day. I'm just going to turn this on and tune it out. I've been riveted. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. But, that means um, a lot. Thank you. <laughs> But what I would say is that as, um, you know, the institution in the city that actually has enough parking um, and that is able to use our parking lot in creative ways, we're starting to think creatively about what that might look in. Is it drive-in movies? Is it spread out rental events? Is it something else? And so I am more than happy to share what we discovered because we've already started actually to get some inquiries about using our outdoor space, whether for a, do, a person wedding or a religious service. So we're gonna be learning a lot. And of course, we're happy to share whatever we learn. That would be awesome. I got in trouble at a drive-in movie theater back in the day, Anita, so. But what, <laughs> TMI, Al, TMI. <laughs> After the drink, Al, and we'll hear the story. Hey, Al. Uh, we all saw we all saw American Graffiti. <laughs> we all got in trouble at a drive-in movie. Yes. <laughs> Even the egghead got in trouble. <laughs> uh, Peter, just, did you have thoughts on this? It was your question, but yeah, I um, a couple of thoughts. Uh, Al to respond directly to the out, idea of outdoor concerts. That is something that we're we're talking about. I think whether it's inside and a socially distanced concert or outside, one of the important things that we also do is that we have the right uh, technology to, to stream this to people who are at home mm -hmm. and to do it at a, at a high quality level. So people who feel you know, connected to our musicians and miss them can at least see and hear them perform. And so that's something we're working very actively on. As far as the, the, the phases go, I mean, I, uh, one of the things that I, I think that we've been so focused on is what to do during this period when everyone's stuck at home and what kind of content we, can we put out there. And a lot of the institutions in town are putting out some nice digital content, but it's been had to move very quickly to make that happen. Mm -hmm. One of the things we also need to then think about is, is to you know, stay on top of when we're going to be able to come back, when we're going to be able to emerge from this, and think about what are those exciting events that we are going to do so that we have something to look forward to. We need to earn the right to keep our institutions as strong as we can during this period. And for those of us who depend in large part on contributed revenue, we need to earn that. We need to be providing digital content, but also continuing to plan for the future and, and be as in a robust position as we possibly can. And sure. so we need to be also, you know, not only focusing on this period when we're stuck at home, but thinking longer, longer term. I agree. That, you know, that's tough, you know, tough to do, but we need to do it. Good call. Jeannie you know, has think that some of the venues, I think some companies like, like at BSO, uh, my wife and I, we, we watched the moth last night. They did a virtual from New York and they said they had 3000 people buy virtual tickets, which is more than they would normally have. I know we, we, you know, in a, in a theater and obviously they weren't charging the same price as they would have if they were in a theater location. But for, for certain organizations, you know, that might be a model that if you have, you know, because you can go out to a bigger arts, wouldn't work for us because we don't have a resident company or we don't have that kind of control, but for, for a BSO or a center stage or even a, a tour of an art gallery, 
a virtual tour of an art gallery, participate with a lecture or, or whatever, there might be uh, an ability to do some of that to generate some revenue and, and keep, uh, keep people engaged with your organization. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting oh, sort of paradoxes of this whole um, situation is that this is another reason that Baltimore is incredible, is that it has a huge tradition of philanthropy, which is what drives our contributed income. And a lot of us have, have really understood that that, that, is, that contributed income is as much about um, supporting the city as a civic entity and supporting its citizens by the pass through um, uh, really services that we all provide um, for the schools and the individuals who come to us. Um, and, you know, I know that there may be five museums in art museums in my national coterie who are free and including the BMA is one of them. And we have all found ourselves in much better financial position because we are free and we have focused on building endowment over, over time. And so, you know, again, it's a really tricky thing in a city where there is such um, opportunity disparity and income disparity. But at the same time, because so many of us act as part of the, the, um, the broader way that education reaches so many citizens and that we provide, we provide services for so many citizens, the, this notion of Baltimore's contributed income um, position is one that I think could stand us in good stead. And I worry a lot about, you know, I get calls from other museums about how do you monetize your digital program? And in essence, we are suffering now, our cultural economy is suffering now from the, the shift in the 1970s to a culture that was that decided that earned income should be their number one priority. And so, you know, there are, there are museums that have 90%, 90, 95% of their annual income through earned income. So they are on that brink right now. So I think a, a kind of healthy mix of earned and contributed income is, is, is something, but, um, I think it's fascinating the the digital world and and how the notion of of how you monetize digital in, in this space. You know, I'm just it, it, no judgment. I just think it's really interesting. Um, so and you know, particularly if you're a, a tickets, um, what I call a butts and seat organization, <laughs> it's really hard. Um, so you know, is there and can we think differently about the model and get away from what is the legacy of i'm just going to say it the king tut exhibition it, this is the legacy of the blockbuster cultural event um and you know e even in terms of symphonies and things like that there are so many that have that have just gotten more and this is not the case of ours but you know more and more and more and more expensive um so you know contributing to that divide i don't have an answer that's just a Mm -hmm. Bomb. Can, can I just throw something out? Um, this is Donna Sawyer. Um, Hi, Donna. I'm not going to turn my video on because I enjoyed this from the uncomfortable position of my exercise bike. So awesome. Uh, <laughs> no judgment. Uh, multitasking. But anyway, I wanted to say that I think Baltimore has a tendency to always um, assume that we can't be philanthropic in the way that we can be. Right. That the broad community um, is willing to invest in the arts. And that was really brought home to me um, just at the beginning of the, the COVID virus when we launched, uh, helped to launch a, uh, a, a fund for independent artists. And the response was overwhelming. It was overwhelming from individuals, it was overwhelming from the philanthropic community, and it was overwhelming in the need of the artists. So we've got both sides of the equation that we can solve, but we just have to get out there and ask the question. If we hadn't put ourselves out and said, um, are you willing to help support a community that has lost its 
income, the, the, the answer was absolutely yes. And now the artists are asking us, we've gotten poems and songs, they, they're giving back with their gifts. So I think we have, um, to, to answer Al's question, um, we have all of the natural resources. We just need to, to get them out there. Yeah. I agree, Donna. And, you know, I, I think all of us on this phone, we, we know that, we understand it. I think the nonprofits in Baltimore, under your point, Julia, they understand the value that we bring. I, and I'm speaking for me personally, I need to do a much better job of convincing our politicos that this industry is worth an investment. And we should not be looked at as a cost. This is an investment that we are bringing both quality of life, helping the, the, the K through 12 school system, job creation, economic development that we talked about earlier. And I'm not so sure that uh, politicians to a broader extent place enough value on what we bring every day. And I, I, I know I have to do a much better job of convincing uh, my political friends that this is an investment should not be on the cost side of the ledger. This, this is on the revenue side. So one of the things that I, I think we have gotten better in the last decade about is doing what you're, what you're saying. And, you know, actually Maryland is the number three funder in the, in the country for state support of the arts. Um, and so individual legislators, I think, get it. I think individual city council members get it. Um, and I know that Anita and Peter and Jonathan and I spend a whole lot of time, and Jeannie um, and Donna spend a whole lot of time demonstrating what is, this, what is their return on the investment for the citizens of whichever constituency we're talking about. Um, for every dollar that is spent on the arts, they get a $3 return at, at, or even $4 at the state level. But what I think we don't do well enough is come together as a whole and demonstrate our strength together because each one of us can individually show our, our, our necessity. We can be of local necessity, but it is really when we come together, BSO, the Museum of Industry, the BMI, the Walters, the Lyric, and if we all went and said, okay, so hi, we're all together here. <laughs> I think that would be a different message from the messages that we traditionally send, which are, individualized um, work about uh, so so I'd love to you know I, th I think that is a, a, a ramification of this COVID is that we are all talking a little bit more often together because quite frankly we we are an industry right <laughs> and that's the that's the voice and that's the the framework that we should be presenting our conversation that um, the, there's, a, there's an economy here that can't be taken for granted and we have strength and it should be place a high value on what we bring to the community. So I can tell you from where Visit Baltimore sits, we want to continue to partner with everybody on this, on this call and um, look at us as being a, a true partner with, with the work we're trying to do. So um, Well, I'm, I, would, I would just like, whew, that's a terrible picture. Um, <laughs> I would just like to add that I think there is a, you know, the old adage, don't waste a good crisis, but also there's a confluence of um, of public will to make that happen, Julia. And there's also now a number of service organizations in Baltimore um, where the opportunity and the ability to actually create um, the, the glue that can make those things happen. Uh, actually, we're at a moment when we really should take advantage of that. And there's a lot, a lot of opportunity. And of course, working with Visit Baltimore, which to me, some of the things, Al, you were just talking about, um, I wrote in the notes that I, we just had a, a convening with about 30 theater organizations. Who knew, right? There's more than 30 theater organizations in Baltimore. And, you know, one of the ideas that they brought up was exactly what you were saying, which is how do they sort of get a good, how do they get a, a, a good housekeeping seal of approval for the sanitation of their site so that there is some standard that audiences can feel comfortable coming back. So thinking about 
the whole ecosystem, Julie, as you referred to earlier, from the smallest to the largest and how they all contribute and making sure that in this blue and this, this you know, sauce that we're making right now that they're all included. It's, it's a kind of sad, but also exciting um, opportunity if we can all rally enough energy with all the things we're trying to accomplish to get that done. If we can um, not have to do a Zoom call while we're on our exercise bike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really conscious that all of you have spent a huge amount of time with us right around dinner time. And um, I'm just so excited to see all of you. And I think what's interesting from my perspective is that there are arts consumers and arts professionals in terms of directors of organizations. And then what Jeannie is talking about are the service organizations. And, you know, the idea that Visit Baltimore, the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts and the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance could actually work together on behalf and maybe the Maryland Citizens for the Arts could work together on behalf of all of our organizations small to large as that that's awesome because I feel like we are also a, a lot of times kind of pitted against each other and I just love that we're all here on this call so thank you Center Club um, and Nancy and Al for yeah, goodness. thank you Nancy thank you Nancy yeah hey, thank you. This is Al, you were awesome this is PJ. If I could just say, this has been a phenomenal session. And um, the Center Club would like to continue to partner with all of you um, in this regard. Yeah. Um, so please keep us involved. Well, you are part of that culinary, um, you know, and, and cultural hub. You're a hub. <laughs> okay, oh. we'll, we'll, we're happy to be a hub if that's useful, but um, we do want to support you all in this effort. PJ, Please. thank you so much. And PJ, your leadership of the club has been extraordinary. So thank you so much. Get over thank that, for sure. Well, in a great dialogue tonight, and particularly I appreciate all the, the other cultural institutions that have joined us tonight that I think really added to the discussion um, and yes, if there's opportunity for more of these, if it's helpful, um, we'd love to be a part of that. And, and Al, definitely, I want, we, we would like to hear more about the initiative that, you are, um, that you're looking to bring to Baltimore. I think it's very, very important for, for all of us. And um, this was great. I thank you all. And I think we might like uh, an affinity group. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be Wine and culture, like, or are we? <laughs> I like that. You, yeah. have a new affinity you notice you said wine first, right? <laughs> I'm going to date myself. It's like culture club. Oh no, no, nobody wants to be. <laughs> Sign me up for that. Sign me up. Okay, that's all. That is a fabulous idea, and I just need somebody to like raise their hand and say, "Yeah, I, we, I will, I will, I will help launch that." So. We've got a bunch of members on, on this call. So uh, if we do it, I'm in. Awesome. We'll do it, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, do it. we'll get it done. Okay. And thank you, Lisa and LaFontaine and Stephanie and Connie and Lindsay and Elizabeth from whom we haven't really um, heard or seen, but we love you for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Great group. This is awesome. Thanks so much. Oh, there's Lindsay well. again, and Lindsay, and Connie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.